Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are um, uh, really delighted to uh, be able to uh, host uh, Chris Rizell, who will be giving the keynote uh, talk from, um, from Georgia Tech. Uh, this keynote talk is also a MIDAS talk, a MIDAS seminar talk. Our normal MIDAS seminars are held uh, at this time, actually an hour earlier. Um, but uh, uh, this, I think, is going to be a, a really uh, interesting view onto neuroscience and neurocomputing and signal processing and the intersections of, uh, of those areas uh, with data science, some really exciting work. So uh, Chris um, is uh, somebody who uh, is well known to us and uh, to whom Ann Arbor is well known. He did his, uh, uh, his uh, bachelor's studies here. Um, graduated in uh, 2000 uh, with a degree in ECE and then also a, a Bachelor's of Fine Arts um, in uh, uh, music uh, performance technology. So um, one, of, one of those uh, multivalent and talented individuals that we so much value here at, at Michigan in our uh, multidisciplinary um, uh, mecca of, of activity. Um, he then went uh, on to graduate school at Rice, um, earning his uh, PhD there, electrical engineering in 2007, and then uh, went and did a postdoc um, at uh, UC Berkeley in the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. That's where he picked up his, uh, his probably in, uh, tools and, and interests in the neurosciences area, um, where he took that to uh, uh, then Georgia Tech uh, and uh, he's been there uh, um, ever since, uh, probably except for a sabbatical. Uh, and his, um, uh, he, he has uh, many um, uh, distinctions and awards. I can't go through them all for, for, for lack of time, but um, he's a career award from the National Science Foundation, Sigma Xi Young Faculty uh, Research Award. Um, he's... Uh, 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 one, one of the recipients, the six international recipients of the Scholar Award in Studying Complex Systems uh, from the James McDonald Foundation, uh, the 21st Century uh, Science Initiative. So really delighted to uh, invite Chris uh, up to uh, give the keynote on this fascinating topic. So Chris, welcome. Thank you, Al, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm pretty sure multivalent also translates to easily distracted uh, when you're doing music degrees and engineering degrees together. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the invitation and to everyone sticking around through a long day to be here. It's been good to uh, catch up with old friends as well as make new ones in the few days that I've been visiting. So uh, in the talk today, I was tempted at first to do a retrospective sort of look at the sort of work that I've done in data science modeling uh, neural systems and some of the foundational work in machine learning that we've contributed to. And on further reflection, I decided to change and instead to give a more prospective uh, view of things. Uh, I'm going to talk today about work that is in progress. Everything that you see today is going to be unpublished and things sometimes hot off the press from last week that we're excited about. I'm doing this because I think it really highlights a unique theme of challenges that I'll point out uh, in a bit here around data science and neurotechnology. So um, just a warning that you'll see things that uh, we don't have all the answers to because we're still working on it. I have tried to uh, sprinkle enough mathematics and, and kind of methodological details so that those of you that are um, kind of experts in that area can get a hint of what we're doing, but um, I'll actually try to move through that relatively quickly so that um, the broad audience can, can enjoy what we're talking about. Um, and if you don't like what you're hearing, zone out for a minute and come back and, and uh, we'll catch back up, all right? Um, I always like to start with the most important slide first. It is truly a great privilege to work with um, phenomenal students and collaborators. I want to especially highlight Greg Canal, John Lee, and Adam Willits, whose work I'm going to feature in the talk today, as well as wonderful collaborators like Magnus Eggerstead, Garrett Stanley, and Craig Forrest that we'll be working with. 
So to give you a sense of the, the context, I am going to kind of briefly talk about um, the work that I did over the first generation of my career that led me to the point that I'm at right now. This is a Wordle um, out of papers from my lab in the last 10 years. You can see it has the right sort of words in it, right? Data featured very prominently, neuro, coding, models, analysis, algorithms. I don't actually expect anyone to read any details on this slide. I really just give it for context of the sort of work that I, um, that I started my career doing. So these are very abstract theoretical models of neural coding, of how information is processed in the brain. So again, at a very high level, the sort of models that might start with an optimization problem that we might instantiate in a dynamical system, and then we might compare what our model does to physiology or the sort of models where we might try to prove actually some theory about recurrent neural networks, which of course are all the rage in machine learning, but also very important structures in how our brain computes. And we might prove guarantees about their performance in certain tasks like remembering signals. Again, the details of this are important. What I want to try to convey is these are the types of models that I was building. And while we still do some of this work, I, um, I got to a point in my career where I was a little frustrated with building models that were so abstract that they were ultimately not testable in experiments. And so the, that was the context for me when uh, a few very important things happened in neuroscience. There was a uh, beginning of communication in first the literature about the need for a major investment in neurotechnology. And then, of course, I, I'm sure as many of you are aware, um, there was an announcement by the Obama administration in a major effort called the Brain Initiative um, that was supposed to be on the scale of the Genomics Initiative. Right, a 10-year, multiple-billion-dollar investment from the federal government matched by private foundations, or contributed to, I should say, by private foundations, that's focused mostly on neurotechnology, on new methods for interfacing with the brain, at least in the early stages of the investment. Right? So new recording hardware, uh, hardware interpreted very, very broadly to include molecular and genetic tools, new interfaces, new ways to stimulate and interact with the brain. So there was a blue ribbon panel put together to set priority areas. These are a, a kind of a reduced list uh, of, what they, um, of what they came up with. And uh, no surprise, I live solidly in number five here, theory modeling statistics. And this was, uh, really marked a transition point in my career to um, not only do the abstract modeling that I have a real scientific affinity for, but also to move toward um, these sort of practical approaches for interfacing with the brain. So in this second generation of my career, if I had to describe kind of the mission statement of our lab, I would say that we developed the algorithmic foundations for interfacing, understanding, and exploiting neural systems. So all the fancy new molecular and genetic tools, the probes, all the things that are being invested in, we try to answer the question of what do you do with those things to be most effective in your experiments and in your interfacing. And we do this in the service of basic science, of clinical medicine, and we do try to learn things that we can take back to machine learning and intelligent systems. And that's what I'm going to try and make a little concrete today. So there are, of course, um, big data challenges. And it's remarkable to me in this very beautiful structure, this is a rat brain in a Petri dish, that something so small can produce such big data. right? Um, I'm actually not going to talk too much about the big data challenges today, as you'll see in just a minute. But I do want to acknowledge um, those of you that may be thinking about application areas that there are an enormous number of big data challenges. There are new methods for doing serial EM microscopy over very small volumes of tissue that produce enormous data sets, where the computational processing of these data sets to reconstruct the 3D volumes is absolutely the bottleneck in this process. We have uh, development of new tools and technologies, including high-density probes of various configurations. Of course, many of you probably know this because there is a long history of this at Michigan. And Michigan has really been one of the leaders in this field. In fact, uh, you talk to anyone who does high-density recordings in the world, and the first question they're going to ask is, well, do you use the Michigan probes or the Utah probes? Right? Uh, so there's a long history that continues here as well. There are other places, of course, that build probes. A, a thousand-channel probe released at SFN, the Society for Neuroscience meeting this year. New optical imaging methods that can record from tens of thousands, sometimes, of neurons simultaneously, with some limitations, of course, because they're optical methods. But th the point is, there's just an enormous explosion of data happening here, even something like a Moore's Law for the number of neurons that we can record from simultaneously. Unfortunately, it does not have the same doubling time as Moore's Law, but we'll take what we can get, okay? 
So I give this again all as context that there are big data problems here that you can all imagine. And they, we do some work on these sort of problems. That is the elephant in the room, of course, is the big data problems that come with this. Today, I want to focus actually on something else, which is there are a number of small data problems that are still actually very important, places where it's very challenging to collect the data, or the data is collected in a way that it really uh, requires us to be very efficient with how we use it. And so that's going to be the focus today of our talk, is how do we maximize the efficiency of small data by using tools from data science, so the algorithmic foundations, and the key thing that's going to permeate all the stories that I'll tell you today, the key thing is we're going to do this all in closed loop systems with biology. So there's no batch processing after we collect some data. This is all going to be how do we do things in closed loop with the biology and the machines in real time to be most effective at what we're doing. We're going to do that today with a tour across scales from single cells all the way up to full systems with a stop in the circuit and network level in between. So this will be a story in three chapters. So the chapters today, chapter one, pin the tail on the moving donkey at the single cell level. Chapter two, mind control with lasers at the circuit and network level. And chapter three, welcome our robotic overlords at the systems level. So that'll be our outline for today here. So we'll start with chapter one. This may surprise those of you that don't work in neuroscience, but actually a fundamental question that we don't even know right now is how many types of neurons are there in the brain? This is one of the priority areas of the brain initiative is to develop a cell census so that we can go through and characterize all the different types of neurons that have both structural and genetic differences and characterize the electrical properties uh, as well as the genetic properties of these cells. We want to know how many neurons, what are their properties, what are the properties of their connections, and then once we figure that out for healthy brains, what does it look like in disease where many of these types of things could be affected in uh, in any number of neurologic disorders. There's a high priority area. The type of data one would like to collect for this is called a patch clamp recording. So we don't have to go into all the details, but the basic idea here is that you would take a glass pipette, you would nuzzle it very cozily up to the membrane of a neuron without breaking it. You would apply a little bit of suction, right? And literally some people would do this with a, uh, a little tube in their mouth where they sip a little bit on it and provide some suction. You form a seal with the membrane around the pipette and then you provide a burst of suction that ruptures the membrane but keeps the cell whole. So now what you have, because this is a hollow pipette, you have access to the inside of the cell. So you can record electrically, providing the highest quality recordings we can get. You also have access to the cell that you can provide drugs or dyes to fill the cell and see its shape. You can suck genetic material out the gold standard recording. In fact, the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle has made it their mission to do high, through, high throughput electrophysiology using this method. They would like to be able to record from thousands or tens of thousands of cells to try and characterize all the different types. Unfortunately, it is, uh, as one of, uh, one of your colleagues I visited with this week um, said, it is probably one of the most time consuming and difficult processes to do in all of physiology. So 30 to 40 minutes to get a recording from a single neuron is typical, and this is after years of training uh, by the individual. So uh, the Allen Brain Institute has a room with, I forget if it's six or eight of these rigs set up, and there's a poor PhD level scientist who sits there eight hours a day and takes brain slices and does patch recordings. A fantastic day for them gets recordings from 10 neurons. Okay, this is a small data problem. Right? We, do not, we want it to be a big data problem, but it is a small data problem. What we would also love to do is simultaneous recordings of connected cells. And that's simply not possible when it takes so much effort to get one. You would lose the recording from the first one by the time you found another cell to record from that was, that was connected. What we're trying to do right now is automation that could enable scientific discovery uh, by helping us understand these cell types. And I should mention this is also a standard protocol in drug discovery. So automating this would advance leaps and bounds our possibility for doing drug discovery. So we're building a robot, and this is in collaboration with Craig Forrest, to replace the experimentalists. So an automated system that tries to do this in high throughput. I'm going to leave the kind of details of the robotic actuators and systems, uh, since I'm not a mechanical engineer, um, to the side for now. I'm happy to talk offline as much as I know about it. For our purposes, we get imagery like this from a brain slice. This is from a microscopy modality called differential interference contrast microscopy. Very low light, very low SNR. 
You can see the cell shows up only in shadow there with an enormous shadow from the pipette about to impinge on it. And what we want to be able to do is track that patch, deconvolve so that we can segment and find the cell membrane so we can drive the pipette. There are a number of kind of pre-processing challenges with this tracking and um, doing some uh, wiener filtering to filter out the tissue noise and things like that that I'll skip over. They're not that interesting. Today, what I want to tell you about is this deconvolution. We have to be able to do it in real time. We have to be able to do it with in-painting so we can remove the shadow effect from the, from the pipette. And we have to get ourselves an error of between one and two microns on the membrane location because that's the resolution of the actuators driving the pipette. So that's our challenge. Typically, if we're tracking as kind of data scientists or electrical engineers, we have canonical tools for this, right? And many of you probably know the Kalman filter would be the first thing you would think of to try and track something that's moving. Oh, I forgot to mention it. The cells are moving, right? Because you're shoving a pipette through this tissue, and so just the mechanical force of it is going to make the cell move around as you're watching it. So to track it, we would normally have something like a state vector, which in this case would be the location of the membrane. We have some model for how it moves, which might be a basic model, like it doesn't move very much. In order to do the tracking, we would take our guess of where it was in the past, complete with a probability distribution that represents our uncertainty. We would project forward through our model uh, of what we think is happening dynamically. We would get a new guess for what's happening. Then we would also get some data. We would get an observation of the, uh, of the cell membrane. So that would be through our DIC optics. So we get some new data which in statistical terms would be our likelihood function. So we have a prior, we have a likelihood function. And our estimate there would be form a posterior distribution and make an estimator from that. And that would be classically a Kalman filter. Works very well when it works. The problem is in this case, right, um, we don't have the Gaussian statistics that this is really designed for. Because what we have in this case is a cell membrane that is very sparse. We're not interested in most of the pixels in the scene. There's a very small number of pixels that we're actually interested in tracking. So what we need is something like the equivalent of this, but with this strong non-Gaussian model of sparse edges built into it. Now, my lab has been working on this for a number of years. This is a, you know, a, one of the more technical slides. I'll go through it kind of quickly to give, uh, again, the experts an idea of what we're doing. But um, if you're not tracking with this, it's OK. We were doing some fancy mathematics to try and track these membranes. The idea for those of you that are um, kind of probabilist and, and uh, machine learning types is we, we set up a two-layer probabilistic model. So we have um, our edges, which we're going to assume are sparse, so use a prior like a Laplacian distribution, and that means we're going to regularize with a total variation norm. So in plain English, that means we're going to ask these images to have derivatives that are very sparse. There are only a few non-zeros in them. We're going to assume that there is an unknown variance on, on each edge location, so we don't know quite how strong it is. And we're going to represent that variance as itself a random variable. That's the second level up here. So we have a hyper prior involved. And the key thing for us is that we are going to take a prediction from our previous estimate of where the cell is. And just like the Kalman filter does by using second order statistics to propagate information forward, we're going to propagate that prediction up here. So what we're going to do is if we think there's an edge in some location, we're going to take the variance and turn it up and make it easier for the algorithm to infer that there's an edge there. And if we don't think that there's an edge there, we're going to turn it down and make it harder to infer the place, uh, to infer that the edge is there. OK, so for the experts, that's what we're doing. Um, for those of you that um, don't quite track with that, what, uh, what you should see here is what we have to do is solve an optimization problem, right? where we have things like the mask from the pipette and the DIC optics involved. It's a complicated optimization. We need to solve it several times because we're going to reweight back and forth. Again, for the experts, this is basically the expectation maximization solution to this problem. So what we've done is we've innovated in this case, um, solving these optimizations with custom numerical routines that solve this very quickly so that we can do it in real time. Again, for the experts, we're doing ADMM types of algorithms for this. So we'll jump to some results here. So this is in a simulator. We've developed the, the world's most accurate simulator for this problem and released it online for others to use. We have the ground truth signal uh, here. This is what's called the optical path length signal. So think of this as kind of the ground truth density of the cell in that slice. This is the mask that we would like to get out in the deconvolution problem. So just a binary yes or no sort of mask of where the cell is that we can easily extract a membrane location. 
These would be uh, competitive algorithms. This would be what the state of the art looked like before we started this problem. And on the end here is our algorithm. So it stands for pre-filtering plus reweighted total variation dynamic filtering. So you can see we have a much cleaner estimate. And in fact, this is just one example. I haven't cherry picked that. This is the average and maximum boundary error, which is the metric we care about. How far off are we on estimating the boundaries of these cells over a very large corpus of data, uh, again from our simulator? I'll show you some real data in a second. And we see strong statistical significance. And in fact, we're getting average errors down to about half a micron and maximum errors down between one and two microns for the first time, which again is within the precision of our actuators. Here's just another example. This is real data now. So this is the raw image coming off of the DIC microscope. This is our deconvolution and then the segmentation from that deconvolution overlaid on the image. You can see if we have the pipette shadow in the way during patching, if we didn't do any of the inpainting, so if we didn't account for that, it's very easy for the tracking to get off. And so if we mask that out and pretend like we don't have any data in these regions where the pipette is, so we call that an inpainting problem, we can go back to having very good accuracy with it. Okay? So that's how well the image, imaging is performing. What I'm going to show you is a sped up video of the robot in action. So this is entirely unreleased. We're writing this up right now. Um, I should say there's a lot that goes into this um, that's not part of the imaging. For those of you that are experts in this, I think the key innovation here for you to know about is um, Craig and his, and his students have developed a pipette cleaning technique so that you don't have to change the pipette after every recording. Um, you can use the pipette over and over again at least 10 times. So I'm going to show you, the movement will be kind of fast because it's sped up from real life a number of times, is I'm going to show you, this is a mouse cortex brain slice. We've gone in and identified 10 cells that we want to record from, so just clicked on 10 cells, and then let the robot run. So you can see, again, very quickly, we're keeping a count up here. This is about 45 minutes worth of recording. So we're going to isolate a cell, the pipette comes in, patches onto it, and then you see a battery of electrical tests being run. Again, this is sped up. It's about 45 minutes total. What you're going to see is we're three for three right now. We're keeping count of how accurate we are. Going in there with a little robot. Yep, a robotic actuator patching onto the cell, so forming that, um, we call it a giga seal to get a whole cell recording, and we get beautiful data off of it. We do fail sometimes, as people do. Right? But we actually have yields that are about the same as a human operator, but it can be done with no training. And this is 45 minutes rather than a day worth of work for a human operator. Yeah. Or for drug discovery, the people who actually know about the pharmacology and the drugs but don't know about this technique can run experiments on their own. So that's, uh, that's kind of an example here where we're trying to take a small data situation and turn it into a big data situation. Where we're headed from here, we have some computer vision yet to do. Uh, you know, we want to be able to automatically pick healthy cells rather than relying on a human to have to pick out the cells that, um, that look good to patch onto. We want to be able to automatically try to um, pick cells that have high probability of being connected synaptically, because that's really what we would like, is to be able to do multiple patches. There are a few groups that have tried to do multiple patching. There's been reports of up to 12 simultaneous patches at a time, and that was a Herculean effort from labs like Andreas Talias down at Baylor College of Medicine. We would love to be able to do that routinely on the everyday, and so being able to pick synaptically connected cells. Um, we have new um, ADMM algorithms, actually, that were not part of the video I just showed you, um, that have in, in uh, CPUs have 100 times speed up over conventional um, uh, software packages like CVX and 1,000 times speed up in the runtime um, when we implement them on GPUs with about the same accuracy. Okay? And these are all amenable to actually using even more powerful regularizers. For those of you in the know, we're doing earth mover distance regularization, which is actually much more natural for these tracking problems, but involves itself solving an optimization that's been prohibitive. And we believe that we've cracked through that barrier so that we can start using that now as a regularizer. Um, so again, the, the, for the pros in the audience, those are the directions that we're headed to right now. Okay? So that's my story about single cell, small data, and how we're trying to use data science not as an analysis technique afterward, but actually try to put it in the loop with the experiments, with the biology, by learning as much as we can about the experimental setup and the experimental limitations, so that we then know how to most effectively 
do better experiments and automate those experiments. So uh, hopefully I've convinced you that we are at least starting to pin the tail on the moving donkey. All right? So with that, we'll move to chapter two, mind control with lasers. So single cells uh, are important to characterize. We need to know the building blocks that we're working with, even as a modeler, right? Building abstract models, I want to know the building blocks that I have to work with. But fundamentally, it's the circuit and the network that I care about, the mesoscale activity. And this has been a real challenge, actually, historically, to get data at the mesoscale. We're very good at getting data at low scales, and we're very good at getting data at high scales, like with fMRI machines. But this middle scale has been very, very challenging, and that's where good things are happening, right? Those, those circuits, those networks, are the core kind of computational elements um, that the brain is using, and that's what we want to try and figure out. Um, I, I, I have a, a great enthusiasm right now because the Brain Initiative is not only giving us new recording techniques, but it's giving us um, new stimulation techniques, right? New ways to perturb these systems. And again, as a modeler, I believe, although we haven't gotten there yet, I believe that these uh, abilities to perturb a circuit are actually going to give us much more causal information that we can use for model building and model testing than passive uh, experiments where you present a sensory stimulus to an animal and record. So I'm very excited about these techniques, although not all the pieces are put together to really show their power yet in that. Beyond just the science, there are actually many disorders that are fundamentally network and circuit disorders. Parkinson's, epilepsy, presumably depression. And we, in fact, treat these by trying to disrupt aberrant network activity, right? So for Parkinson's, a standard treatment is to put a stimulator down deep in the brain a very invasive surgery with a little neurostimulator packet under the clavicle that runs up and basically injects a small amount of curtain, current whose uh, purpose is to disrupt bad activity in the circuits that seem to be responsible for motor control um, and so that are affected in Parkinson's where you see the sometimes the tremoring but often the slowness of movement and things like that that are characteristic of Parkinson's. So even though this is very crude, we have no idea really what this is doing. We simply uh, stimulate, usually at something like 130 hertz with a biphasic um, you know, rectangular pulse. Very crude, but that disruptive simulation can be uh, almost like magic for these patients, for the ones that it works well for. And I would encourage you, if you've never seen this before, search YouTube videos of this, right, where you see patients that have the stimulator implanted, and they will be unable to do even very basic tasks. You flip the simul stimulator on, and within seconds, you know, where they started like this, trying to touch their fingers together, within seconds, you wouldn't even know that they were diseased. Now, of course, this has downsides, and, and um, it wears off over time, as any medical treatment does, but it's really a remarkable sort of advance, even though it is as crude as it is, okay? This is stimulating with essentially uh, hooking a fancy wire up to a fancy battery. Okay? which has all sorts of downsides, actually, for doing neurostimulation, including it makes it very, very difficult to actually see what you're doing. Because if you tried to record from the neurons while you were doing this, you would get stimulation artifacts all over the place. You would barely be able to see what's happening in the neurons because of all the current you're injecting. Remarkably, there are some phenomenal new molecular and genetic tools coming online. The one that uh, I'm excited about uh, and want to tell you about today is called optogenetics. Um, I, I can talk in more detail later about the history of how these were developed. Um, it's really remarkable stuff. Essentially, what we go do, and it's off-the-shelf technology, we do this in the lab um, with my experimental collaborators. I'm a completely computational lab, but work closely with experimentalists. We do this routinely where we genetically modify the animal, so we can use all sorts of fancy, um, very precise genetic targeting sort of methods that we can say exactly what types of neurons we would like um, to be affected if we want. And we genetically modify it to put ion channels in the membrane of the cell that are photoreactive. What that means essentially is we can go to these cells and shine a little bit of light on them of a certain color, blue in this case, for an opsin known as channel rhodopsin, and we can excite that cell. We can make that ion channel open up, and it's just like we injected current into it. There are other opsins called inhibitory opsins that basically work in the other direction, where they send current out of the cell through mechanisms that are a little bit fancier, but the, for our purposes will have the same sort of effect, where we can shine light, presumably of a different color, on them and inhibit. So now we have a gas pedal, and we have a brake for our cells, and we have it using light. Even though these cells had nothing to do with the visual system, they're not part of the eye or anything like that, 
We can do it with light, which means we get minimal stimulation artifacts in electrical recording. So for the first time, we can record electrically by putting a wire near the cell, and then we can stimulate the cell while we're recording from it. And it doesn't blind us the way that conventional microelectrode stimulation would. The promise of this is to be able to do functional dissection of neural circuits. And so you see diagrams like this all the time um, in the literature right now, where they'll say, okay, putatively, we have three cells, X, Y, and Z, and we think that they're connected, but we're not sure. We want to understand how they're connected. And so we might do something like put an excitatory opsin, like channel rhodopsin, in one of these cells, shine a bunch of blue light on it, and see if we measure a response at this other cell. If we do, then it means the cells were connected. Or likewise, we could put an inhibitory opsin in this cell, and we could silence it. We could take it out of the computation altogether, right? Uh, essentially, what I would call a fancy lesion study. It's like we're removing the cell, but we do it temporarily because we can just shut the light off. So this is commonly what's done, is either shut the cell down or send it to the rails and look for an effect downstream, okay? The problem is we don't just care about connectivity here. Right? We actually care about how they're connected and what functional role they have with each other. Because um, some of our work, again, that I'm not talking about today, is trying to understand the neural code. And with my collaborator, Garrett Stanley, really to understand the neural code, if we could read and write the neural code, we would know that we've understood it. If we could make recordings and try and decipher sensory information that's come in by looking at the recordings from the cells, but then critically, if we could then stimulate the cells with our own activity and make the animal believe that it saw or heard something that it didn't, if we could do that successfully, then we've understood how information is represented in that area. Okay? So people talk about this as functional dissection, but I would say it's the, the crudest form of dissection, right? where you're only trying to find out if they're connected, but you're doing it in, in a way that doesn't give you any refined information and also um, doesn't actually uh, it doesn't actually tell you anything about uh, an ecologically relevant uh, operating regime. These are very nonlinear systems, and you've taken it way out of its normal operating regime by sending these cells to either complete silence or complete activity. And so what we'd like to be able to do is uh, precisely control not just the stimulation, but actually precisely control the activity of this cell. Because if we knew what one of these cells was doing as input to this cell, then we would be able to do regression and other things, conditioning on the activity coming in, and understand what that cell is doing. Again, those of you from the neuro background know this concept quite well. Right? We've used it over and over. It's, in fact, the basis of how we understood the ionic basis of the action potential. Right? We had all sorts of different ion channels, which were uh, coupled variables in the membrane. We wanted to decouple them so we could understand what each was doing. And so we did a technique called a voltage clamp, where we put a closed-loop controller around one of the ionic currents so we could study the, study the other currents in isolation. Okay? And that's, in fact, exactly what we want to be able to build here. I want to build the cellular and network equivalent of voltage clamp. I want to, I want to build a circuit clamp and eventually a behavior clamp, because that's when we know that we've really understood the coding in these circuits. So why can't we do that right now? The problem is there are too many unexplained variables. If I just shine my light right here, I actually don't know how much activity it's going to induce in the cell. There are all sorts of things that affect that. One, the amount of expression of the opsin in the cell, completely out of my control. Two, how much light is actually getting to the cell. I can measure the light at the tip of, say, a fiber optic cable, but I don't actually know how much is getting to the cell because of scattering. Three, there are all sorts of different state modulations happening in the brain all the time. On the tens to hundreds of millisecond timescales, you can see changes in how neurons respond that are due presumably to modulatory functions, neurotransmitters, chemicals that are changing the way neurons function that we have no control over. Okay? So it does us no good to try and precisely control the input to these neurons absent anything else. We have no idea actually what the output would be. But we're engineers, right? And in fact, I'm an electrical engineer by training. So my instinct, closed loop control, feedback control, right? I want to precisely control uh, activity so we can get scientific understanding. I want to be able to cruise control for this neuron. I want to be able to set not just a fixed point like you do in a car for a speed, but I actually want to set a time varying trajectory of what I want that neuron to do. And I want to use closed loop control to step on the gas, step on the brake in real time as I need to in order to precisely control, again, not the input, but precisely control the output of this cell. Okay? 
So that's what we're doing. Here's our setup. So again, this is with my experimental collaborator, Garrett Stanley. We're working in rats. So this is in a deep structure in their brain called the thalamus, and it's in the part of the thalamus called the vibrissa pathway. It's what controls their whiskers. Not controls, I'm sorry. It's what uh, processes the sensory information from their whiskers, um, which is a dominant sense for these animals because they're nocturnal and they don't use as much vision as we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a recording electrode coupled with a fiber optic cable down deep in the brain. We're going to isolate a cell. We're going to record the spikes that come off of that cell, sometimes while we're giving it sensory input, and we're going to do feedback control. Okay, so we have a target firing rate that we've set. We're going to do a simple proportional integrate controller. So we're going to look at the estimated firing rate from the cell. We're going to look at the difference, and we're going to increase the stimulation proportional to that difference with a little bit of integration over the air. So if we're making errors for a long time, we're going to, we're going to up the stimulation. We're only doing this with an excitatory opsin, so only a gas pedal. There are no brakes on this runaway train. Take what we can get right now. There's some technical challenges with co-expressing both opsins that, uh, that people are working on, but for right now, just a gas pedal. We have, of course, the neural system in the middle that we're controlling the LED input power to, so the light power. There may be disturbances happening that our algorithm doesn't know about. These are changes in brain state or sensory information. The spikes come out, and then we have to estimate online and in real time the point process statistics of what's happening um, in this neuron. So we have a few steps here. We have to choose our target, which is always going to be the green signal. We have to decide how we're going to estimate it, how we're going to do our observer, and that's going to be actually very limited by the hardware. We have to have a model of this, which we'll talk about in SQL. So we're going to collect a little bit of experimental data to model the system that we have isolated. And then we have to tune our controller based on that system and then actually start our experiment. So that's going to be the high-level view. Um, those of you interested in the details, so again, the somatosensory thalamus, we're expressing channel rhodopsin um, through viral transfection. Uh, we're doing a single electrode tungsten, uh, tungsten electrode recording um, coupled to a fiber optic cable, so an optrode if you are a user of such things. We're going to process this in real time on their experimental hardware, which in our case is a Tucker Davis Technologies system. Um, that is going to be extremely limiting to us, um, as I'll mention. We can do online spike sorting. So online detection of spikes happens natively in the hardware, and that's what we get as output for our algorithms. Okay? We might be doing this while we're giving sensory input, controlled sensory input, um, through a galvo motor on the whiskers of the animal. Okay? So that's the experimental setup. So we had two computational challenges. So the first one is the observer. We're going to use a very simple uh, filter, a very simple exponential filter, so a fixed bandwidth filter. There are a number of things you'd like to do here, including something like state space point process filtering, so something like a Kalman filter, but for point processes. And that is not allowed on the current hardware. It's simply not supported. We're moving to a new hardware system where that is possible. Um, so look for that next year sometime, and we should have some results on that. The key thing we have to do, though, is we have to pick the bandwidth of the filter. Right? We have to optimize that for whatever our target is. Right? You might say to yourself, well, I would like a really long bandwidth because I'd like to average as much as possible to get the best estimate I can. But the problem is then you're going to miss any high frequency activity in the target. So you need to go to a higher bandwidth filter. But of course, then there are very few spikes at a time. So you get a very noisy estimate of the firing rate with that high bandwidth filter. And you would get just noisy uh, estimates. So there's presumably some Goldilocks solution in the middle here, depending on what the frequencies are in the target that you're trying to track. If we had actually a very slow um, target, then maybe something in this bandwidth would actually work very well. But we have to kind of pay the piper if we want high bandwidth, uh, if we want, sorry, high frequencies in our target. Um, so we've done some work to try and optimize that through so simulation of sinusoidal um, inputs to Poisson firing rate generators. Um, mean integrated square error is our figure of merit that we're trying to minimize. And using, um, using some theoretical background coupled with some extensive stimulation studies, we've been able to fit a power law distribution to um, the time constant, basically normalized to the modulation frequency of your target. That depends on essentially how observable your, um, your firing rate is going to be. And that depends on a few things that I'm hiding from you, but I'm happy to talk about offline. Primarily the modulation frequency and the spike rate. All right, so if you have few spikes, the problem is harder. If you have high frequencies, the problem is harder. So the harder the, uh, the, harder the problem, actually the more um, conservative you have to be with your bandwidth. So essentially what we have here is a recipe book. 
You tell me what the highest frequency is that you want to be able to represent, and we can do a lookup table to tell you what your optimal filter is to use for this online filtering. Okay, our second problem is the controller design. Okay, so if we had a model of the system, uh, we could do you know, kind of empirical fitting of the parameters of our feedback controller, but the problem is we don't know the system. And collecting data to, um, to model the system is actually very expensive, right? So this is, again, a case of small data. I want to use just a little bit of data at the beginning of my experiment so that I don't waste all my time in my experiment fitting the model. I actually want to do my science. Okay. So the question is, we're going to fit a very simple linear, nonlinear Poisson model. So a linear filter followed by a static nonlinearity followed by a Poisson uh, spike generator is going to be our model. We're going to fit that to data. And our question is, how good does that model have to be? Most of the time, and the other half of my life, I would really, really worry about this question, right? I would want as much data as possible to get the best model, and by best model I mean most predictive, of, uh, of the neural responses. In this case, the question, how good do they have to be, the, the answer is not that great, actually. We need a model in the ballpark, but we're actually very robust precisely because we're doing closed-loop stimulation, right? Model inaccuracies we can correct because we're always adjusting. We're always tapping the gas and tapping the brakes. So we can see in open loop stimulation, um, the error here, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to label it. This would be error. The error uh, drops off dramatically if you do things like change the bias or change the gain, so the additive or multiplicative component of the model. If your model is not right on, but you're trying to do open loop stimulation, you pay the price immediately. But in closed loop stimulation, you have much more robustness, so low error uh, compared to compared to that. In the future, we're going to be doing some switch state um, models, so uh, not just trying to fit one system, but recognizing that the system goes through these state changes and fitting multiple models and having multiple controllers. In fact, that's working pretty well right now, and we're writing that up um, as we speak. So how does it work? This is data. Uh, this is real electrophysiology data, not simulation. Again, the green is the target, so just a simple sinusoidal target. This is closed-loop stimulation, so you can see the average controller output and the average response of the cell is shown in black. The single trial traces are in the light gray lines there. So you can see we actually get a very faithful representation in this case um, to the target signal. With open loop stimulation, which is the, the comparison here to make, right? you see this. So we're using pulsatile stimulation because that's what most people use. We're using graded stimulation in our closed loop controller. Um, this actually looks exactly the same if you were to use graded stimulation in open loop. So you can see, actually, the average case is not bad. On average, with open-loop stimulation, we can do what we want to do. The problem is the single trials are all over the place, right? There's much more variation, and I'll show you that um, very quantitatively in a second. Also, if there's a disturbance, so if we start stimulating the whisker, which is going to change the activity of the cell, we don't tell the controller about that. That's hidden. That's a surprise for the controller. You can see it loses track for a little bit, but it's able to compensate and kind of stay in the ballpark, where, of course, in open loop, it has no notion that the baseline activity of the cell just went up, and it should back off of its stimulation. And so you lose the track there. That's just with a sinusoid. This is another example with a naturalistic sort of firing rate trajectory. So this green line is a recorded firing rate trajectory from a cell in this area in a completely different animal at another time that we're now using as our target. So we're trying to replay this trajectory to the cell. This is actually done during some active whisking of the animal. So the way to think about this is we're trying to force this area to think that there is active whisking going on rather than passive uh, waiting for a stimulus, even though the system may not be doing that. So that you can see how this may give us a way to do some causal perturbations of, of the coding properties. You can see, again, an average case, both do quite well. But if I plot the Fano factor, which is the variance over the mean, you can see a substantial improvement. In fact, it's 35 40% improvement. So the way to interpret this is, on average, you can do just as well in open loop. But on single trials, closed loop gets you a much tighter coupling to your target. So you know every time you repeat this process, you can get close to your target and not just count on the average case responses. Okay? So this is all. Um, this is all very, very early stage stuff. Uh, this paper is just under review right now. Um, on the kind of computational side and technology side, we want to control state variables other than firing rate, have kind of multiple system models that we're switching between, maybe multiple options and stimulators, so new technologies coming online, some of it being built here at Michigan, where you don't just have a single fiber optic cable, but you have light emitting pads happening down on the recording electrode itself. 
Toward the clinic, there are actually some really exciting things happening as well. These genetic modifications to do, uh, to do this light stimulation are, uh, are not approved for human use right now, except for an, a, uh, some very, very narrow cases. And it's unclear if they ever will be clinically relevant. But we can still use these as scientific studies to help push us toward the clinic. So two exciting projects going on right now. One is working on an epilepsy model in the same system that we're working in, the, the rodent uh, thalamic cortical pathway, for those of you that are experts. So epilepsy models where the goal is to use this closed loop control to reject the epileptic activity but maintain the normal activity. So this is the problem with any sort of stimulator for epilepsy right now is they can detect that a seizure is about to happen and they can use stimulation to shut the circuit down which does, in many cases, prevent the seizure from happening, but you've just shut the circuit down. So it is entirely noticeable to the person, has very unpleasant effects, and what if we could reject the seizure activity without shutting the circuit down, with letting the, the uh, regular activity maintain unperturbed? So that is a direction we're heading in right now, just scoping out. There are many epilepsy models to choose from that all have different properties, so we're working through that with some people on the clinical side um, to try and push that project forward. The other very exciting project in this same sort of theme is we actually just got notice of award a couple weeks ago on a brain initiative grant um, where we're working with clinicians to do deep brain stimulation for treatment resistant depression. So again, these are, um, these are stimulators that are being inserted down deep in the brain just like with Parkinson's as I mentioned. With Parkinson's it's an established therapy. With depression it is entirely experimental. So oh, small numbers of patients that are in very extreme conditions, no other therapy is working for them. Um, and it turns out that in some cases, you can implant these electrodes in different areas of the brain than we do for Parkinson's, but they're actually the same electrodes, and inject current to disrupt abnormal activity, just as we do in Parkinson's, and these people can see therapeutic benefits. So we're working with one of those clinical teams in psychiatry at Emory that's been doing this for a long time. Uh, the problem is it's very hard to know what's happening, what's the mechanism of the disease, and therefore, how do we prescribe clinically exactly where to put the electrode, exactly how to set the stimulation parameters, and things like this. The role of this grant is to try and quantify all of that so we can make actually prescriptions, so we can take the actually extraordinary sort of response rates that they see in the clinic at Emory, where they're seeing you know, upwards of 65, 70% responses out of patients who were not responsive to anything else and translate that to, um, to other, other clinics, other labs. So we're the data science end of that. This is not optogenetic stimulation, so it's not by light, right? But the key thing is we have access to an experimental device. So Medtronic made 100 devices that have electronics in them so that you can record from the stimulation site while you're stimulating. It's very small snippets, uh, but they gave those out in research grants, and the team at Emory was awarded 10 of those. So we have six patients implanted right now, four more to do, and it's the first ever look inside the human brain while you're stimulating a depression patient. So we're looking for biophysical markers of health and disease and of effective and ineffective stimulation. So I'm very excited about this project, literally just getting going on it, just found out about it, but it's going to chart out um, some exciting data science problems in the next few years. Okay. So uh, I want to pause for just a second because I know that there are some neuro um, experts in the audience, so I'm going to do shameless advertising for 10 seconds. If this sort of topic interests you, we just got notice that we were selected to run a workshop at COSINE this spring, Garrett Stanley and I on exactly closed loop control of neural systems and circuits for scientific discovery. We have an amazing panel of confirmed speakers here that are really pushing the cutting edge in this area. So if this is the sort of thing that interests you, I'd invite you please come out in March and spend some time with us. I think it's gonna be a really great time. Shameless plug over, back to the science. So that was chapter two, mind control with lasers. All right, moving on to chapter three, our final chapter, welcome our robotic overlords. So moving into the systems level, so whole brain sort of interfacing. So if you've been paying any attention to the news lately, there has been a spate of uh, announcements about companies starting up to do neural interfacing, including some recognizable names like Facebook and some other names you may not have heard of unless you're in the space, but you can't hardly go a week without hearing about a new neurotechnology company that's trying to get some information out of the brain. Okay, so very exciting from a technological point of view. 
right? We have all sorts of interest in being able to interface with the brain uh, to interact with our complex world. And these companies all want to do slightly different things. Facebook thinks that you're going to type by thinking someday instead of with your fingers. And each of these companies want to do something slightly different, right? But the point is they all want you to interface with a complex world, okay? Um, there are many clinical disorders that actually prevent people from using their motor system. And so even though they are neurologically um, very cognition, um, they're locked in in some sense. And so that's the other use case here, and probably the one that you hear about most often if you pay attention to this field is taking uh, people with diseases like ALS, cerebral palsy, stroke, spinal cord injury, and giving them an interface. And you've probably seen um, you know, the kind of very fancy news reports on 60 Minutes and elsewhere of people who are paraplegic getting implants in their brains and then controlling robotic arms and very complicated movements. Beautiful, beautiful work. So those are the sort of things that these disease patients may be thinking about. But non-invasive methods are strongly preferred, right? Those cases that you see on TV are just a handful of patients because it's so invasive. It's a major brain surgery with an implantation of an electrode into your motor cortex. If we could do this with non-invasive methods, we would strongly prefer it, right? The problem is non-invasive methods were limited to um, very low SNRs, very noisy signals, and so we can only control very simple cyber-physical systems. So 99% of what you see with non-invasive brain-computer interface is essentially controlling a cursor on a screen, so back and forth, or another problem that essentially reduces to controlling a cursor on a screen. So it might be a drone moving back and forth, but that's really just a fancy cursor. Again, there's been a lot of really great work here, but there is still this barrier of being able to control complex systems instead of just simple movement from non-invasive interfaces. If we could do that, then in health and in disease, it opens up a whole other world of interfacing with the brain. So I have a short video to show you to motivate this. So if you've seen, how many people have seen the movie Big Hero 6? Yeah, okay, so we have just like a minute or so. This is, for those of you who have seen it, um, you know, but to set the context, this is the hero of the story whose name is Hero. He is trying to be admitted to a putative Caltech-like school for graduate school, despite his apparent age. Um, and his admission pathway is to do a science project that he presents at a science fair where his, uh, his desired mentor will be watching and he wants to be selected. So um, hopefully the audio is turned up here and we'll listen. This is a microbot. It doesn't look like much, but when it links up with the rest of its pals, things get a little more interesting. The microbots are controlled with this neurotransmitter. think what I want them to do, they do it. In case you're wondering, uh, yes, showing a Disney movie and a talk is the apex of my career. It's all downhill from here. The distributed control of swarm robotics, as you're seeing on the screen here, has actually been a hot topic lately with a lot of advances. My collaborator, Magnus Eggerstedt, uh, is one of the world experts in this. And what you're going to see here is uh, his lab is the GRITS lab. You're going to see a swarm of robots here that have been commanded to spell out GRITS, G-R-I-T-S, an homage to the food staple of the Deep South, the GRITS, right? And the key thing here is there is no centralized control of these robots. All these robots are doing, they get the pattern, they say, oh, you need to form a G. They don't know where it has to be formed, so it's in all different rotations. And all that's happening is they know the locations of their neighbors, and it's a distributed control algorithm that's operating for them to form these, these, uh, these shapes. Now, so there is no mothership that's telling each individual robot where to go. So it's really remarkable that this works, um, but it does after many years of, um, of development in this area. So, this is a solved technology, right? Even you see they're going to come up, they're going to move one, and they, oh, they freak out and they go back, they figure out how they have to adjust to go form the ladder, right? So that's a solved technology, right? So we, we've got it. Why 
is Big Hero 6 science fiction. Why can't we do what was on the screen? Okay? The interfacing is not that good. Right? The neurotransmitter that Hero had on his head, there is no way we can extract some robust image of a hand waving out of that sort of signal. So EEG, electroencephalography, is the common sort of interface and presumably is what Hero was using, although they didn't include that technical detail in the movie, to my dismay. Um, it records aggregated low frequency, or, um, lo yeah, low frequency potentials, so the activity of many, many neurons at very low SNR. Okay? So the typical use case here is that you give the user a couple of discrete things that they can choose to think about, and you try and detect which of that small number of things they are thinking about. So for instance, uh, you know, binary classification, you give them, and this is what we will use later, you give them the task to either think about waving their right hand or think about waving their left hand. They think about that and you try to classify from the signals you're getting which hand they're thinking about waving. So that would be a binary motor imagery task. Okay? When we do these sort of binary classification tasks, we can get accuracies 80 to 90%, maybe just a touch higher than 90%. In our hands, it's closer to 80 because this is not our expertise area. But if you really worked hard to refine that, you could get up to close to 90%. So the key thing to take away is there are substantial errors. And even in the best hands with this technology, you're still talking about 10% error of these bits. Okay? So in a typical BCI sort of setting, you have the signal processing. Um, and the feature extraction to try and classify. And then you give the person feedback about what you just classified, right, left or right. But that's all you give them. So they can try, I guess, to, to think to themselves how they have to think differently next time to get higher classification. But that local feedback is, it really is unclear how they should respond next time, so how they should change what they're doing in a global sense. So by global sense, I mean, not what they should change to try and get their classification accuracy higher, but in the grand scheme of trying to co control something complex, how should they change the data that they're delivering to the system? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to leverage some recent results in feedback information theory. So those of you experts in this area know that having a feedback channel um, doesn't increase the capacity of a communication channel, but what we're learning relatively recently is what it can do for you is it can make the encoding process, which is normally very complicated error correcting codes, it can make those encodes, that encoding algorithm, much simpler and in fact something that a human can do mentally. Right? So it actually gives us a chance to do this with the human out here with a noisy EEG channel to the system on the other side with a feedback pathway. In telecommunications, perfect feedback is a pipe dream. But in this example, the human can see what the computer, or in this case, the robotic swarm is doing. So it gets perfect feedback about what the machine thinks uh, you, you want. This basically reduces to an algorithm called posterior matching, or probabilistic bisection. The idea is you have a set of messages, which we'll abstractly think of just between 0 and 1. And you start out with just a uniform distribution um, on the receiving end, right? You have no idea what the human wants, but you show this to the human, and the human gives you one bit of input, which is the message I want to send, does it come to the left or to the right of the median of this distribution? You do that. There's an algorithm for updating the posterior distribution, and then you show the median of the distribution to the user again, and they say, well, was it to the left or to the right of the median? So it's essentially like you have an enormous dictionary there's some word in the dictionary that you're looking for. So as the human, you know what you want the swarm to do. right? You know what word in the dictionary you want to have happen. And the swarm is going to show you the middle of the dictionary. And you have to say, does, does my word come in the first half or the last half of the dictionary? The swarm gets that answer and says, OK, let me reduce half of the dictionary and then show you the middle of that. You say, does it come to the left or the right? And you keep reducing, except we have to do that in a probabilistic way because there's so many bit errors, we don't actually want to throw half of the dictionary away. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have desired swarm behaviors uh, be a word in dictionary. I have to explain to you how we're going to do that. That's our key innovation here, so hang on to that. Um, we show you the posterior median. Right? You give binary input, and we're going to do it through this motor imagery task. So the human is going to see the shape of the swarm. They're going to say, well, this is the current shape. I want it to be this shape. So does that come before or after in the dictionary? So I have to think left or right hand. 
Okay? This has been shown before, actually. This observation about using this technique for um, brain-computer interfaces um, was made by Todd Coleman, who's at UCSD and actually another proud Michigan alum um, of ours. So Todd and I are old friends, and we've been talking about this idea. He has done this on text entry and path planning. We are taking this to Big Hero 6. We're taking this to swarms. So here's our alphabet. The swarm behavior is going to be described by four letters in an alphabet. The first letter is the horizontal position in the arena, left to right. The second letter in the alphabet is up and down. The third letter in the alphabet is how many sides does the shape have, so circles, triangles, squares, pentagons, and so on. The fourth letter in the alphabet is how big is the shape, so the radius of the shape. Now we need a process of ordering them. We need a process to basically alphabetize so that we can say of uh, this big, enormous dictionary whether our target shape comes before or after. And we can do that, in fact, just as we alphabetize words. We have four letters, so we're dealing only with words that have four letters. And you start at the first letter. And you say, are the first letters the same? If they're not the same, you have a natural ordering here, left to right. And you can say, I know immediately which word comes first. If they are the same, then you have to move on to the second letter and say, well, what about up, down? Let me compare that. And you make a decision. If they're the same, you move on to the third letter. So you basically, just like alphabetizing words, you go through until there's a letter different. And then you have an ordering just on that letter that tells you what comes before or after. So the key thing here is we're actually searching over all four parameters at a time. The comparison the human has to make is sequential. But with the input to the swarm, it's actually giving input that's reflective of all four parameters at once. So we're not doing sequential search over each of the four parameters. That's only what the person has to do mentally. The input that we're giving is much more efficient because we're giving input about all four letters at once. And this could be extended to many more letters, so much more complicated shapes. We've run a Mechanical Turk study uh, on this with very little training. We didn't hook them up to EEG. We just had them do the fundamental task of the alphabetization because one, I can't give them all an EEG rig, but two, the training to do the mental imagery task is actually substantial. Um, so that part requires work and training. With just minutes of training, they can do this at 95% accuracy or higher. So they can do this task, even though it sounds a little weird to read it the first time, they can do it. And then we implemented this on the innovative Robotarium, which is an open access, remotely accessible swarm robotic research platform at Georgia Tech. If any of you do swarm robotics, you can log in and run your algorithms on the infrastructure there. Okay? So I'm going to start this video. We call this swarm control via interactive neural teleoperation, so Skynet for short, um, which may be my enduring intellectual contribution over my career is the acronym. So let me tell you what you're going to see, because uh, this is going to go by a little quickly. So I want you to be able to pay attention. So this is Greg. Greg is a student in my lab. He spent a lot of time putting gelled electrodes on his head. We should all thank Greg for his service to our country. Greg is watching the swarm here. So he's, he's been given uh, a target shape for them to make. Right? So this is intrinsically what he has. He's trying to drive the swarm to that target. So he can see the swarm. They make a current shape. Right, which you'll see up here in the overhead. So the blue line is the target that Greg has been given to drive them to. You can see the robots. He has to infer what shape they're making, which you can see is, is actually introduces some error because there aren't that many robots. And so with more robots, it would be more clear what the shape is, but that's what we have. Down here, you're going to see the posterior, right? So it's flat. So the, um, the, the blue line represents the target in this one-dimensional message space. Okay? So what we're hoping for is that this posterior that starts out flat will eventually cluster and peak and be shaped as a delta right around that blue line. We start out with a guess, which is the middle of the dictionary, and that's what's going to be, um, that's what's going to be moving. So you see at first, the very first prompt is shown here. The very first prompt is the, in the alphabetization, which Greg is doing mentally, he knows his message is down here, and the message they're showing is here, so he needs to go right. He needs to go later in the dictionary. So the correct input is right, and you see in this first, uh, this first binary input, he's going to be able to convey the correct input. But sometimes that will be an error. So we'll see this go on. This is sped up eight times. The main constraint here is the speed of the robots moving. Getting the bit out is just a couple of seconds. So the speed of the robots is the main constraint. So you can see he sees their shape. He makes a guess. The posterior is 
uh, is shaping itself over there. He's mostly getting the correct input, but our overall error rates here were close to 20%, and you will see some errors where the posterior goes a little bit off track and he has to correct it with, with more errors. So there was an error right there. You see it's, it doesn't look like it's honing in, which is strange if you don't know the lexicon, right? It doesn't look like it's getting closer to the desired shape. But that's actually what makes it most efficient because we're searching over all four parameters jointly in what's actually proven to be the optimal, um, the optimal approach from an information theory point of view. There is no binary scheme that could be faster than this. We're getting there. The posterior has to get up to the dotted line in order to have enough confidence to say it's converged. So he's refining there, obviously, in, in just adjusting the last letter now, which is the size. And you see it's now converged to the right shape, so the robots will settle into the shape. Okay. So as you can see, nailed it. We are doing exactly <laughs> what Big Hero 6 is doing, right? So this can extend. Um, so we actually have worked on building lexicons with many more than four letters. So this is a lexicon for doing shape segmentation in computer vision. So how would someone use an interface like this to highlight an object in a scene, right? I think that's interesting, but really where I want to go is actually closer to the Big Hero 6, right? Instead of driving direct variables like um, the shape of this ellipse or the shape of those robots, I want to be able to say in a brain-computer interface, have a lexicon that is instead high-level semantic things like uh, I would like to take pencil, move to that spot on the table, right? And that could also be ordered in a lexicon where um, computer vision and robotics could kick in and make very smooth movements rather than having the person directly control the individual state variables of these robotic arms. The last kind of point here is I think there are non-clinical applications. There are all sorts of places where we want to get, through a very noisy interface, rich, complex information out of a brain and into a computer. Machine learning is one of them. Right? We have experts labeling data. Right? That's a, some rich representation of some decision surface that the expert has that's conveying with individual labels. And uh, I think that we can use some techniques to go beyond active learning to interactive machine learning, where the human and the computer are actually operating in closed loop together rather than one-way uh, interaction to make that much more efficient. So that's our story. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this as, as a wrap-up uh, across the scales, that I think that there are wide-ranging opportunities for data science. <laughs> For people that are willing to learn the biology, learn the experiments, so that they can be informed by the modern neuroscience toolbox. So um, I hope that that gave you kind of a taste of some big data, but mostly here small data problems and how data science can interact with that. So thanks very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris, for really. Um edifying and exciting presentation. That's, that's really fantastic. Um, there are time, there's time for questions. Um, we need to have people come up to the microphone for, um, to ask the questions since there are people on um, our webinar streaming application. I also know I ran a little over time. So okay, Chris. Yeah. Yes, sir. So one of our talk. So I have two questions. Yes, sir. So first one, so in your first part, so how the, the robot can determine so which neuron it wants to record? How can you determine this is the hair right. of the cell? Great question. So in our system right now, the human has selected the neurons to record from. So they, they simply click on the cell that they would like to record from. Just you know, click, so they're not outlining or anything like that. So in what we did, in the video I showed you, literally the human operator click, 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 click on 10 cells and then walked away. They actually, they leave the room uh, to make it very clear. You know, and the, 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 the other sensing that's going on that I didn't mention is you can actually sense the impedance on the tip of the electrode, and you can use that as an auxiliary signal to tell you when you're getting close to the membrane. Um, so we would love to be able to have the robot know which ones to go to, but that is next generation of the computer vision, and I have no idea how to do it, but it's the obvious thing to try and, to try that's and do. That's great. So the second question, so in your, in your second part, so you show us that the closed loops, the control in the centimeters, right? Yes. So how did this uh, experiment, what's the mechanism of this, the closed loop control through like, the feedback inhibition? Or no, so we're only looking at a single cell and we're doing the controlling. 
right? We're shining a light on that cell. So the controller lives in the box, in the box. That's, si that's sitting, it lives in the Tucker Davis you know, electrophysiology system that's sitting next to the rig. So we are doing all of the control. Now there are other cells that are being affected, right? Because that light shines on a lot of cells and yeah. they have some secondary effect right. um, on the cell. To us, that's a disturbance. That actually makes our job harder because the cell is getting unmodeled input. So that's what it is in our system. I'll say there are people, notably Bob Gross at Emory and uh, Chris Moore at Brown University, that are using bioluminescent closed loop optogenetics. So they're making cells that glow and other cells that are responsive to the light so that the neurons can stimulate each yeah, other. Yeah, become a feedback inhibition and then can modulate the Even cells. though there's no synaptic Others. connection between them. And they're yeah. using this for things like epilepsy or stuff like that, very, very early stage. Um, but there are people doing that, but that's not what we're doing right now. Okay, thank you. Great, yeah, thank you. Other questions? I'm wondering about that la in the last section. Um, there's a, a still a, an encoding, a digital encoding, or binary encoding that's mm -hmm. necessary uh, to, uh, to to basically actuate that feedback signal from the uh, human controller. Mm -hmm. um, but in uh, you know in, in a in a reinforcement learning type of approach. Um, you may not necessarily require that kind of investment in to an encoding function like mm -hmm. you know your four-letter uh, alphabet. Rather, some continuous function yeah. that perhaps may be even adapted to the particular individual over time, yeah. Yeah. where they they just have to basically give a yes/no uh, whether the evolution mm -hmm. of the swarm robot is seems to be going in the right direction. Right. Yeah, that would be another way to approach it. The only individualization that we do is training actually the classifier, the EEG rig, so not the encoding. But that's, um, in principle, that sounds great. I'm not sure how one would actually do it, but that sounds like, yeah. sounds like a fruitful area for research, so we should talk about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. On the last part. Uh, you speak up a little. On the last part yes, of your uh, lecture, I wonder, if that uh, feedback can be used to for one person to another person directly without the machine in the middle. Oh, yeah, so for person-to-person -person communication? Yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent question. You know, the computation that's being done on the receiving side is you know, a more sophisticated computation. So they're updating the posterior based on the sequence of bits that's come in, and right. that's a little harder to imagine how that could be done mentally by a person, but I don't know, I have to, I'd have to think about it. I'd that, have to think about it. Interesting. Require, require two subjects to learn together to uh, give them a, a fixed task. And right, but it's asymmetric. There's more computational burden on the receiver than on the I transmitter. See. And you know, the whole point of the feedback is that you can make the job of the transmitter simple enough that it can be done mentally. I'm not sure if we could make the job of the receiver simple enough that it could be done mentally. An interesting idea, but I'm not sure. All right. Yeah. I think, so. yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I was curious about the mechanism that's used to make a neuron uh, sensitive to light. Yeah. Is it something that has to be done, um, like, like, at what point in the lifespan of an organism can you change the sensitivity of a neuron sure. to light? Sure, great question. Um, so in a mouse, they would do this transgenically. So you, you get the mouse from birth, it'd been bred into the mouse, you order from a catalog. I want these neurons in this area to be you know, responsive like this, right? And then you would breed and you would cross and do all the sort of things that are very fancy. Um, in anything other than a mouse, you have to do viral transfection. Okay, so you take, in our case, we use an AAV vector, so adeno-associated virus. You load it up with the genetic material for the ops and you inject it through a little borehole into the area you want to transfect and then you wait you usually wait about three weeks, four is a little bit better for the expression, right? And after that, then it is sensitive. And you can do that, uh, because it's viral, you can do it actually any time during the lifespan, as far as I know. There may be some restrictions. I'm, I'm certainly not a you know, molecular neuroscientist, so there probably are some restrictions that I don't know, but basically you can kind of do it whenever. Um, it works to varying degrees. It works very well for us in rodents. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, there have been some trouble with getting it to work in primates. There's been some success, but we still have a ways to go. So basically for every animal, there has to be a, um, a toolbox built 
on the you know, genetic transfection side. Um, they're working on that. In fact, they're working on it for humans as well. There, is, there are a couple of viral transfection FDA-approved um, research studies now, including one for optogenetics in uh, retinal prostheses. There's one in the US and one in Europe right now. So that would be one path. The other path for this that I have no idea if it's going to work out, um, and I, I honestly don't know enough to understand what I'm saying to you right now, but the other path for this that people are looking into is mRNA-based expression, which, again, you're starting to get outside of my comfort zone. But as I understand it, the key thing there is it's temporary expression, which may be more amenable um, for humans than viral transfection, because you could, you could do it through the mRNA. It would last for a little while, say, for a clinical therapy, and then it would go away. So again, we're way out of my comfort zone right now. I'm a mathematician um, and have no business talking about vectors and viruses and stuff. But um, that's what I've been absorbing. So I can regurgitate that back to you, and hopefully it's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Go, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? I can. I don't think it's coming through on the system. Yeah. I, oh, here we are. Um, just for a sec, because I know we're standing between the um, refreshments now. What kind of students, uh, what kind of, uh, what's your ideal student looking like? What do you have to train them to do to be yeah. uh, good graduate students in your lab? It sounds like a quantitative neuroscience program yeah. or something. Most like that. of my students come from ECE um, with occasionally some BME students. So the more quantitative end of the and biology spectrum. They picked up the neurophysiology yes. and everything in I, addition. Neuro I would personally much rather take someone with a quantitative background and teach them about the biology oh, God. than to try and take someone with a biology background and teach them well, quantitatively. We know, we've learned that lesson a long time ago. But that's my personal preference. There's a lot of neuro, neuroscience yeah. involved here yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they learn as much as they need to for whatever project they're working on. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, there's another question. Well, we'll make this the last question. Okay. Great. I appreciate it. The Thank you. Yes. So I wanted to ask you about, uh, do you have uh, any plans to increase the information transfer rate? Uh, for instance, you know, I was thinking uh, maybe it's more of a parameter of the classification accuracy and the fact yeah. that the coding has been wrapped around that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know what... Great question, because it comes up very naturally if you're talking about implantable electrodes, right? Implantable electrodes, we can get eight bits at a time with 99, you know, eight bits at a time we can decode basically with like 99% accuracy, much higher SNRs, right? Uh, I don't know exactly what to do with all that information, right? In theory, the, the framework that I showed you of the feedback information theory, it fits into that just fine. But what's unclear to me right now is um, how, to, how to implement that in a way that it's still a mental calculation that can be done by the person. So we're certainly thinking about that. We've actually just hired in Atlanta someone that does exactly those sort of implants, and so that's on my mind right now. Um, you know, if we had a higher bit rate at the interface, what would we do with it? Um, uh, and I don't know right now, but I, it's a great question. It's one that's keeping me up a little bit at night, but it's, it's a great question. Great. Thank you all for the great. time. I appreciate it. Yes, let's thank the speaker.